everyone to Springside Chestnut Academy's Connect series. Some of you out there may not know me. Um, I'm Steve Druggan, and it's my honor to be the head of Springside Chestnut Academy. Um, I was thinking about, as I was on my run in the woods tonight before this, I was thinking about why these conversations are so important and why they're so important in my life. And I really go back to, uh, I want to give a shout out to my mom. I think my mom's out there. And I grew up in a very small town, but my mom made sure every summer she would take me to the Chautauqua Institute. And she would take me to Chautauqua every summer where there were lecture series every week, every summer on nine different themes. And these weren't lectures that were going to make you change your mind. They were gonna force you to think. They weren't there to convince you that their opinion was right. They were there to make you think about their opinion and change your opinions, or maybe not, but at least to think about big topics. And over the last five years at SCH, we've had a number of uh, wonderful speakers with us. We had um, Lisa Damore and Michael Thompson. We had Julie Lithcott Hames. Last year, we had Marshall Mitchell and Josh Shapiro. And all of these have been interesting, thought-provoking things that the next morning when you're, when you're on your walk or you're in the carpool line, you think, huh. And it did make you change a little bit of what you're thinking about, which is what we should be doing, I think, every day. It's continuing saying, I used to think, and now I think as I get new information. And well, I have to hand it over to the, the team that puts together our Connects events. They have put together a really incredible panel tonight to talk about a subject that has no quick and easy answers, but a subject that we should all care about. And so we are joined tonight by three people that have connections to our school currently as parents. Steve Call. Steve is currently the Dean of Columbia University School of Journalism. Steve has written seven books, many of which are about Afghanistan. He won his second Pulitzer Prize for the book Ghost Wars, an examination of the history of the CIA and bin Laden in Afghanistan. Before his role in Columbia, Steve served as the CEO and president of the New America Foundation, a public policy institute in Washington, DC. And very importantly, Steve lives in Chestnut Hill, with his wife, Springside alumna, and journalist, poet Eliza Griswold, and their son, who's an eight, eight-year-old and third grade at SCH. Steve, thank you so much for giving your time tonight. Delighted to be here, look forward to it. Steve is joined by a newer member of our community, Helena Malikyar. Helena is, the, is Afghanistan's former ambassador to Italy. Ciao e buonasera. Helena was consulted with USAID. She's been a board member of the Afghan Research and El Evaluation Unit in Kabul, Kabul, Kabul and com, uh, Commissioner of Afghanistan's Anti-Corruption Monitoring and Evaluation Committee. She has worked as a news and current affairs consultant with Afghanistan's leading television station and owns her own translation company. Helena recently moved to Chestnut Hill and joined our community with her 16-year-old son who is in 11th grade. Helena, thank you for being with us tonight for sharing your wisdom. And our conversation will be moderated by a much longer term member of our community, Renee Shanalfata. Renee is a seasoned interviewer and reporter who worked for more than 20 years on Philadelphia's NBC 10's news team and earned an induction in the Broadcast Pioneers Philadelphia Hall of Fame. She also has had the pleasure, I think, of working with me on a number of uh, video casts for SCH Community, where I always feel completely inept after watching the recording of how amazing Renee is next to me. She is now the executive director of the Philadelphia's Lawyer for Social Equity, a nonprofit dedicated to assisting low-income Philadelphians overcome hurdles caused by the, their past criminal records. Renee is a former SCH trustee, as well as the mother of an SCH graduate and a current senior class of 2022. Again, thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you so much, Steve, Helene, and Renee for giving us your time, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Steve, for those great introductions. And good evening, everyone. You know, I think I speak for everyone when I say how much I've been looking forward to this conversation. As Steve said, I work for, I guess, close to 25 years in local TV here in Philadelphia. So I was on the evening anchor desk for 9-11 and the war in Iraq, and then of course the surge and then the early withdrawals. And, you know, I guess, the biggest challenge in all of that was first trying myself to understand what 
was taking place in Afghanistan and putting the pieces together. But then much more importantly, trying to do a good job of conveying that information to the audience and making them care and making them want to tune in. And I, I have to be honest with you, um, I think collectively the media did not do um, a good enough job in that area. So for a host of reasons, I am very much looking forward to this conversation tonight with Helena and Steve. But, you know, before we get into sort of the nuts and bolts of Afghanistan, I would just, I, I think it would be helpful to sort of understand both of you have dedicated so much of your careers to Afghanistan. How, how did that happen? And can you maybe just sort of share a little bit of your general career paths. And um, Helena, maybe maybe we'll start with you. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's delightful to be here um, and to talk about uh, a topic that is very, very important to me, and it should be important to, to others as well. Um, how did I end up um, working on Afghanistan? Well, naturally, um, I come from Afghanistan. And um, I, uh, I became a refugee along with my family when I was 15 years old, um, after the first communist coup happened in Afghanistan in 1978. Um, and uh, then after uh, finishing my studies, of course, I, at NYU, I went to the Middle East um, studies department and I focused my all of my research on uh, history of um, Afghan state building um, and that led me to uh, later on uh, getting more hands-on work on Afghanistan and in, in 2001 um, in the beginning of 2002 I returned to Afghanistan it was for the first time after 23 years that it was possible for me to return and um, I uh, stayed there, uh, settled down and uh, worked um, in different capacities uh, on issues of governance uh, in the country. Um, and uh, finally, I was appointed by President Ashraf Ghani as um, Afghan ambassador in, in Italy, uh, which was sort of a short lived uh, mission. Uh, and now it's more of a liability on my CV that I'm starting to look for, for a job. But anyway, all very interesting experiences. Um, and um, um, it's, it's very, very sad at this point to see what's happening in Afghanistan. Heartbreaking. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Helena. Steve. Uh, well, so I uh, started out in journalism um, essentially at the Washington Post about five years out of college. And um, I wanted to become uh, an international correspondent. And I was assigned by the newspaper to South Asia based in New Delhi. And Afghanistan was one of the subjects that I covered from day to day. It was the most important story going at the time I went out there in 1989. And so I started traveling to the country. I, I was in and out of Afghanistan for three years. Um, during a period of the war when um, uh, the Soviet Union had left and a civil war uh, was underway in different configurations. Um, and I became deeply interested in Afghanistan and, and very um, uh, taken by it as a lot of Americans now who have uh, traveled to the country since 2001, whether on military service or um, humanitarian missions or academic study. Uh, you know, Afghanistan is a place apart. Uh, there's no place like it in the world. And uh, it has an extraordinary peoples um, whose culture of hospitality uh, makes entry as an outsider uh, very, very easy. Uh, at the same time, um, it was a country that through no uh, doing of its own had been uh, in a state of suffering for, um, you know, a, a, a bitter decade by the time I arrived, and now three decades later continues in that suffering. Um, it, there's a cliche, and in, in, uh, sometimes you hear from American politicians, well, Afghanistan is just a, it's not really a country, or it's a country that's always at war with itself, or it's a collection of warring tribes. All of that is false, and you don't really have to spend a lot of time in Afghanistan or read very deeply to understand that this was a nation very proud, independent, uh, never, never part of anybody's empire, 
um, that lived at peace with itself and its neighbors through most of the 20th century and the wars that started that we're still in the middle of, um, I fear, uh, began with an outside invasion by the Soviet Union. Um, and it was not a civil war until uh, this invasion started. And since then, uh, outside countries, some great powers, some regional, have been trying to find their own security in Afghanistan by intervening. And it was that story um, that really attracted me and that on 9-11 brought me back to Afghanistan uh, as a journalist and a book author and so forth. So, so that's the essence of why I've stayed so connected uh, to this story um, uh, since I first went there. Yeah, and Steve, you know, listening to both you and Helena talk, it makes me think back to when I was on the air. And if we could have somehow conveyed what you both just said, I think it would have made people care more or want to understand more. And I, you know, you both have said so much that we need to unpack. And before we get to that, though, I'd like to just just briefly ask you both how we became so fortunate to have you as part of the Chestnut Hill community and as part of the SCH community, starting with you, Helena. Um, well, for me, it was not by design. Um, my son and I were going to help my mother move from Arizona to Chestnut Hill, where my brother Sultan is a longtime resident and owner of Chestnut Hill Coffee. Um, and um, Hirman and I were planning to move on, go back to Afghanistan, where there was an interesting job waiting uh, for me. And then suddenly um, things went uh, down so quickly. Uh, the government collapsed in Kabul and the Taliban took over. And um, we decided to, to stay here and make it home. Um, but I'm, I'm so glad that uh, if, if that were going to happen anyway, I'm so glad that we were here because we have uh, experienced an enormous amount of generosity from the community here. And uh, it's, it's a good place to restart yet again. That's good to hear, Elaine. Life changes in an instance, though, doesn't it? It does. Steve. Well, uh, briefly, I've been at Columbia, and um, Eliza and my wife and and our son uh, were up here, and uh, but Eliza's parents have um, uh, live in Chestnut Hill, and her family has deep roots. I think her grandmother went to SCH. I I know. But there's a lot of family members who have gone to SCH. Um, I lose track of all of these uh, family trees, but uh, I know they're deeply rooted. And so um, we were New Yorkers in living in the city and looking for um, a way to visit her parents and bring Robert to meet his grandparents. So eventually we got a place in Chestnut Hill to come to on the weekends, a little bit odd. Uh, New Yorkers go to the beach or to the Hudson Valley. We, we drove from one city to another, but- in Philadelphia, uh, okay. Yes, uh, but as someone who grew up in, uh, you know, in DC, I appreciate Philadelphia, the human scale, the greenery, especially around Chestnut Hill. So it, it felt like a getaway from Manhattan. And so we really enjoyed it there. And then um, during the pandemic, we kind of migrated down to uh, Chestnut Hill, to our place in Chestnut Hill, and eventually decided that we would uh, change our our plan and put Robert in school down in uh, Philadelphia and, and I would commute up here and Eliza as well to NYU. So that's what we've been doing. Last year we uh, shopped for schools and of course there was really never any question. Robert rode by SCH on his bicycle and said I want to go there and uh, so um, that's that's where he is and he's had a wonderful experience and it puts him into a, a deep family tradition. That's terrific. Well, we're so glad. I know I speak for everyone when I say we're so glad that that you both are here. Um, you know, going back to what I had said in the beginning about not in, in telling the story, not knowing how to sort of put the pieces together for people and sort of, you know, understanding that I think certainly our audience, all audiences, come to Afghanistan with a certain understanding and a certain level of understanding. And, you know, in approaching this, I mean, you know, Steve, you talked about, you know, the Soviet occupation, you talked about, you know, after, you know, 9-11, um, sort of 
put all of that into context, but then just a little bit talk about what is the reality right now on the ground in Afghanistan now, now that the United States has pulled out. Well, um, you know, Helena can speak to this as, as, as well. Um, uh, Afghanistan faces a grave humanitarian crisis at the moment. That um, is probably the most important thing to understand. Um, the country was suffering from a drought and from uh, economic problems associated with the reduction of international involvement in the country, but um, also uh, natural, uh, you know, afflictions, crop failures, and the like, even before uh, the fall of the Islamic Republic. Uh, now that humanitarian crisis is compounded by a government that um, does not display the capacity to handle um, a humanitarian uh, crisis of this scale, um, and um, that the international community is wary of supporting um, for fear that if it provides uh, humanitarian assistance, it may legitimize the Taliban government. Then compounding that humanitarian crisis is a political crisis, the sudden restoration of the Islamic Emirate, as the Taliban call, call themselves, um, intolerant um, historically of minorities in the country, um, already displaying um, intolerance and uh, you know, uh, detentions and disappearances, uh, beatings in custody being documented already by uh, human rights groups and journalists, and a lot of uh, anxiety among the Afghans, at least that um, lived in the cities um, uh, before the Taliban arrived, about where this is going to go. Um, and of course, an entire um, uh, majority of the country or half of the country uh, facing basic questions about access to education and the workplace. Taliban, uh, there was a lot of talk before this summer about a new Taliban, a, a Taliban that had learned its lessons in exile, that understood the world better than it did in the 1990s, and that we would see um, a more inclusive government and a more socially inclusive policy, even um, you know, in adherence to Islamic law. And of course, the Islamic Republic that it toppled also um, honored Islamic law under a different interpretation. So. Uh, we, we thought, uh, some people thought that the Taliban might be different, and I think the evidence so far is uh, they're very, very much the same as they were in the 90s so far. Helena, would you agree with Steve's assessment of that? I know you have family, obviously, still, still in Afghanistan. What are you, what are you hearing? What, what do you see? Um, yes, um, the... Um immediate um, problem that uh, the population is facing is the economic stagnation and uh, um, you know uh, I mean millions of people according to uh, UN estimates are faced with starvation uh, literally um, there are no salaries the government can't pay salaries uh, businesses have uh, stopped um, a lot of uh, capital has fled the country, um, you know, private, uh, the private sector um, and uh, small businesses uh, can make money because people just don't have the purchasing power to, to, to buy even, even the everyday basics, um, uh, you know, like food stuff and stuff. Uh, so, um, yeah, I hear um, a lot of uh, you know really horrendous stories from the people um, who uh, can't really afford uh, to to even provide one meal a day for their families. Uh, whereas uh, before, a few months ago, they they had jobs, paying jobs that you know could make um, a decent salary and live. Um, maybe not um, you know lavishly, but but fairly comfortably. Uh, so yeah, the humanitarian crisis um, and the food shortage or, or not being able to buy food uh, is the most urgent and immediate uh, problem in Afghanistan right now. But of course also um, you have a, a group that has taken over that uh, is, uh, is unable to govern. They don't know how to. Um, they are unwilling to, to include everyone, um, either in the power structure or even, you know, having, um, 
you know, equality in terms of um, implementing justice or, or um, in providing services. Um, they clearly um, uh, have a problem with uh, gender equality. They have problems with minorities of Afghanistan. Um, and uh, so these issues are, are pretty uh, serious concerns um, which need to be dealt with, but, but the immediate concern right now is, is a dire humanitarian situation. So then what is next? I mean, when you talk to people, when you hear commentators, there seemed to be a general consensus that yes, you know, the United States needed to withdraw uh, I, I think there's also consensus that the way it happened was, was a nightmare. So now that we have this situation, what happens next? I mean, you're talking about a humanitarian crisis. You're talking about uh, an old Taliban, new Taliban. It's not a new Taliban. It's, it's, it's the same Taliban. What, what are the next steps? And I, I, I feel silly asking that because that's, that's been a, a question for 20 years, 40 years. But what do we do? Well, I think you can, uh, the, the, the question that faces governments, our government, European governments, other governments, even, even um, friends of the Taliban, like Pakistan's government next door, is um, whether to respond to the humanitarian crisis uh, at the level that the Afghan population requires while risking uh, in the delivery of this aid um, the, the legitimization of uh, the Taliban. Um, this is the dilemma that I hear um, European and, and American decision makers wrestling with. Um, the Europeans want uh, to prioritize humanitarian aid, I think more aggressively than the Biden administration um, is comfortable doing. The Taliban are a listed uh, you know, organization subject to a lot of sanctions. What the Europeans want to do is to separate the delivery of humanitarian relief from the questions of political recognition and legitimacy around the Taliban, but they kind of need American permission because of the way our laws and sanctions work. If you get out in front of American sanctions, you can get yourself into serious trouble. So there's a question of how much, how far will the Biden administration go to address the humanitarian crisis? And if 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 you were counseling them, if 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 you were, yeah, you know, you had an ear or you had the ear of the president, what how are you leaning? What, what would be your suggestion? Because I do understand the argument, you don't want to legitimize the Taliban, and yet you have people suffering. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, my, my job is to try to figure out what happens and how it happens, and not so much to tell people what to do, but um, in direct answer, um, you know, I find the European position persuasive, um, not only in this case, but in general. Um, it is possible to separate political policy from humanitarian um, uh, relief. And often, um, even when you think you might be uh, jeopardizing your, your political position um, by providing visible and meaningful relief to populations that are suffering, you generally come out ahead. <laughs> uh, you know, people, people recognize that. So um, I, I think that the Biden administration's hesitancy is partly about its own exhaustion with this subject. Um, it's, in, I don't know what emotions to attribute them, but the, but the catastrophe of their experience with the withdrawal over the summer, the political price they're paying for it, the, the reputational price they've paid, I, I fear has just made them want to wash their hands of this subject. And so the urgency of the humanitarian crisis, I worry, is not going to attract their attention. And when governments are in that position, the easiest thing to do is nothing. And nothing will mean sanctions and will mean inadequate aid. Yeah. Helena, you, uh, you, know, you talked about going back to Afghanistan. Um, 20 some years ago, everything, you know, I, I think gains were made for women that's undeniable in, you know, in terms of education, in terms of career opportunities, government service. What happens now? I mean, all of that, you know, once you've had a taste of, of freedom and, and equality, you don't go back. So, so can you sort of predict, I mean, 
what is going to be the status of women going forward, given what had happened over over the past 20 years in terms of, you know, in, in increasing and empowering the rights of women around it, young girls around education and opportunity? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, although uh, predicting anything uh, related to Afghanistan is very risky, yeah. um, <clears throat> simply because uh, there are so many factors involved in Afghanistan, so many foreign hands involved, uh, you know, um, that uh, just when you think you have figured it out, uh, you know, something different happens. But uh, let me just begin by um, dispelling um, one perception. Um, there is a general perception in the US especially that um, prior to 2001, prior to the US involvement in Afghanistan, um, Afghans were living in dark ages, you know, forever. They were a uh, sort of a tribal backward nation of wife beating men. Um, or, you know, uh, at best, the romantic um, description was uh, noble savages. Um, whereas in reality, Afghanistan comes from a, a long um, heritage of uh, struggle for women's rights, for human rights, um, for freedoms, uh, freedom of speech, etc. Um, I grew up um, in the Afghanistan of 1960s and 1970s. Um, my mother was an intellectual, uh, an avid reader, um, um, you know, and, and everyone around me, um, albeit mostly uh, the urban population of the country at that time, um, you know, a lot of women, uh, girls were going to school, um, women had careers. My own great aunt was one of the first uh, senators uh, in Afghanistan. We had women parliamentarians, we had women in, uh, as cabinet ministers, and then various mid-level uh, positions. Um, so uh, we, Afghanistan was well um, on the way to progress um, for um, women's uh, equality. Um, in fact, um, Afghan women had the, the right to vote um, before many other countries in our region um, and even before Switzerland uh, got uh, you know, universal suffrage. Um, but uh, all of that, um, and, and then during the communist period, um, uh, women's issues uh, further were strengthened. Um, but then when the Mujahideen uh, freedom fighters against the Soviet uh, invasion, when they took over in uh, early 1990s, um, the uh, decline started for women at that point. And um, then when the Taliban took over for the first time in 1996, uh, women were completely um, banned from uh, public life uh, until 2001. So uh, after 2001 and with the uh, help of the US and uh, the international community as a whole, um, Afghan women picked up uh, where they had left off before. Uh, so it's not, in a complete void that, um, you know, these things happened in the past 20 years. Um, and and uh, a lot of good things happened uh, for Afghan women in the past 20 years. Um, uh, but uh, unfortunately, now the, you know, the future is bleak. Um, and especially um, because of this massive evacuation of um, the, the elite, um, you know, just about anyone who had a higher education and training and, uh, you know, a little bit of experience and whatever field, they have, they have been evacuated from uh, Afghanistan. So we are also faced not only uh, with the Taliban's view of, of um, you know, women being against uh, women's education and being in the workforce, but also whatever we had created in the past few years, um, there, there is a brain drain that I don't know how Afghanistan will deal with in the future. 
That, thank you so much for that, Helena, because you're, you're absolutely right. There, there is this perception, certainly I had it, that you know, prior to these past 20 years, it was very much you know, a, a, a bleak situation. And that gives me hope for thinking that you know, despite what may be happening now, as you're saying, there is a tradition of, of women. And, and I think it also speaks to the issue of not knowing enough about others' cultures and others' history. And you know, so thank you. Thank you for that. And you mentioned the evacuation. I, I wanna talk about the, the most recent evacuation that you know, this in, in August, Steve, you and um, Eliza were involved in helping Afghans escape, I understand, from the airport. Um, as Kabul was falling. Um, can you describe some of the efforts that, that were taken then? Well, Eliza uh, did 99% of this work. Um, and so I'm only describing what, um, what I saw her do, um, sometimes sleepless nights uh, at the heart of it. Um, you know, the essence of the problem uh, after the government fell and the Americans uh, came into the airport was that uh, the American mission was to evacuate US diplomatic uh, and military personnel and close uh, allies on their own lists. And every other NATO country um, was operating with similar priorities, but uh, journalists, for example, um, as well as many other people in civil society were connected to networks of Afghans uh, in Kabul or in other parts of the country uh, who were directly threatened by the Taliban's return to power, but had no easy way to get to the airport or to get onto a plane. Um, and what Eliza and her team did was, um, you know, absolutely heroically ended up uh, raising, um, you know, four to five million dollars in the United States to charter Airbus planes where they flew people out eventually 330 at a time. I'd never known you could charter an Airbus plane, but it turns out that you can for a price. And the main harrowing part of the work was identifying um, individuals, groups, family groups in Kabul who were under threat, uh, who wanted to leave um, and who um, were scattered around the capital or who had come to the capital from other cities, getting them onto buses and then getting them inside the perimeter of the airport. Um, and the, the, the picture of the variety of individuals who um, were under threat and who ended up on those buses was like a snapshot of the crisis. Um, so we were started out working on journalists because we all had colleagues and and uh, you know collaborators and interpreters and then their families and and so we had hundreds of people uh, who we knew through journalism networks and that's where we started. But at the end, you know, it turned out that the most um, striking example was that uh, I remember watching Eliza work on a bus that was stuck outside the airport and I asked her so who's who's on the passenger who's who are the passengers mm -hmm. oh this is the Sesame Street bus Sesame Street because there was a Sesame Street franchise in Afghanistan um, I assume in Dari and Pashto and there was a whole you know children's television workshop crew who didn't want to take their chances with the Taliban for understandable reasons and and who had to be evacuated. Well, they weren't on the US military, you know, SEAL Team 6 mission because they were, you know, on the outer ring of the American investments in Afghanistan. And there turned out to be tens of thousands of people like that. Um, okay. Now, you know, as, as the ambassador says, um, if they all leave, Afghanistan will suffer at least until they can return. Um, you know, in other moments of exodus, uh, people, Afghans do have an extraordinary attachment to their homeland. And so when conditions permitted, as after 2001, they have gone back. So I think, you know, we can take some hope that this exodus is not a permanent one, but for many, many people who were left behind, I do believe it was necessary uh, for their own safety as they very strongly believed as well. Sure. Thank you for that. Um, Helena, what are you hearing? I, I know you have family that's, that's still there. Um, yeah, definitely, and and it's it's uh, very close uh, to me because my own husband is stranded, and we're trying to to get him, um, you know, here. Um, but then um, there are other um, family members, uh, friends. Um, there are um, some orphans that I was supporting in the past few years. 
they are stranded um, and I can't even do anything about it because they were not officially, you know, my children. Um, so um, it's, it's, it's a chaotic situation and nobody knows um, what to do and, and how to help um, loved ones. It's gotta be frustrating. Um, you know, let me take a question from, um, we have a lot of members in the audience tonight. And I, I just wanted to, to um, ask either Helena or Steve, um, this is coming from Maria, and she wanted to know if you could speak to the unintended consequences of NGOs' role in these types of military states. I think Helena should take that because uh, let's broaden the question to the good and the bad of, of NGOs in Afghanistan since 2001. Thank you, Steve. Helena? Uh, yes, uh, earlier um, Steve was talking about um, trying to separate the humanitarian needs of Afghanistan right now from the, you know, politically recognizing the Taliban. Uh, it's, it's a very tricky issue. And um, as um, I've been saying for a long time, with all the good that the NGOs are doing in the world um, and in less fortunate countries, countries at war, um, the, um, there is also uh, an unintended consequence um, that um, it allows, because the NGOs are taking care of basic needs of populations, um, whatever government is in power is uh, given a free um, right to, to be despotic, to do whatever they want, to be irresponsible, uh, because, because the population doesn't demand uh, services from them. Um, so, um, and, and this is certainly a, a fear that, um, you know, the Taliban might uh, very well use this opportunity um, to do whatever they want and absolve them, themselves from, from uh, the responsibilities of a government. Um, but uh, when you have uh, such a desperate situation, um, it's impossible to, to ignore uh, the population uh, just because there are some uh, negative aspects to um, having this uh, NGO system at work in the country. Um, so um, I think uh, governments, the US or Europeans and other donor countries, uh, they should tread carefully um, and I believe there is a way to, um, to take care of the immediate needs of the population without uh, empowering the Taliban government. Mm -hmm. You know, I, um, I had asked both of you sort of what the answer was going forward. And Helena, you, you touched on that a bit in talking about you know, non-governmental organizations, NGOs. But there's a question here from Doc Sal, which is rather detailed. Um, I'm gonna try and do it justice, but um, he says, it seems like there are two possibilities going forward in Afghanistan. One, Lebanon, where a once stable state is in permanent chaos because other actors interfere and prevent the legitimate government from ever forming. The other option, he says, is North Korea, an isolated state primarily supported by an outside power, perhaps Pakistan or Saudi Arabia. One lesson here is how fragile states are and how once they are broken, how hard they are to put back together. The question, are there models we can look to of rebuilt states that have been successful? What did it take and what, what did it take then and what would it take now? Either one of you would like to, uh, to tackle that. I feel like that's Elena's question again. <laughs> unless, you want, unless you want me to take my turn, I leave it with you, Ambassador. Take your turn, Steve, and then if I have something to add, I will. Steve? Well, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not a development specialist. I, let, let's take the, the kind of comparisons, obviously, and I'm sure the questioner uh, recognizes and intends this, they're, they're of limited help. Um, every thing is its own thing, um, and every country is its own country. But if you were to choose between those um, uh, models, you would, you would see Lebanon as the more relevant one because um, 
of the role of outside powers in the neighborhood in fomenting continuous war once the cycle began and the complexity of um, political reconstruction um, uh, there. Um, but uh, I don't think that any country but Afghanistan is the right uh, place to start, really. And Afghanistan's own history, as uh, Helena was reminding us, um, is one of um, a very powerful national uh, identity, national affiliation. Um, if anything, nationalism has been strengthened by the experience of being Pakistan's victim <laughs> over the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, you know, all these uh, soccer teams and robotics teams, and, you know, that's not just social change or social um, aspiration, that's national identity. Like people are doing this for Afghanistan uh, because they're Afghans. Uh, and so I, I'm not sure about uh, other states, but I do know that Afghanistan has a powerful and resilient sense of national belonging and independence. And I do believe that will survive some of, some of these crises. In terms of development models, I mean, you know, I don't have a degree in development economics. My observations as someone who's worked a lot in the emerging world um, across Asia and, and um, you know, Africa, mostly Middle East, is um, development can occur uh, and reconstruction can occur very rapidly when there are two conditions, peace and governance. Uh, and if you have sustained uh, peace, it doesn't mean there can't be a single uh, residual conflict. Um, but if you have sustained uh, peace and that allows uh, international investment to flow and you have uh, reasonably capable, coherent governance, um, generational wealth can be created very rapidly in this world. I mean, you know, not to suggest that these are model uh, states um, and, and they have political troubles. But for example, when I went out to South Asia, Sri Lanka was one of the countries I covered. And it was in the throes of the most nightmarish uh, death squads, civil war I've ever covered. And, you know, a generation later, after the war was ended, sometimes brutally, uh, Sri Lankans have enjoyed an enormous surge of uh, income and opportunity, um, even states that used to be, you know, the subject of uh, marathons on rock stars like Bangladesh are transformed compared to what they were in, 19, in the 1970s. I have no doubt that Afghanistan has the potential uh, to achieve a rapid, as it did in the cities uh, after 2001, a rapid middle class formation and, and, you know, sort of streak of development, but it requires peace and it requires a government that is not uh, fundamentally fractured. And for that, um, you know, the rest of the neighborhood has to become part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Mm -hmm. I agree. And if I may add um, to that, um, if, if we look back um, for lessons learned, um, in Afghanistan, basically, if, if we could sort of, you know, put uh, things in, in general categories. Um, two things that went wrong um, with this um, experiment of the past 20 years, or, or even before that. Um, number one is um, the tremendously destructive and negative role of Pakistan, which I am really baffled that nobody talks about. And I believe, uh, Steve, you, you have done enough research on this to know um, what kind of a role Pakistan has played in, in uh, destabilizing Afghanistan and, and weakening um, Afghan states one after another. Um, <clears throat> so um, uh, to, to ignore that or to uh, play that down um, will uh, will result in failure of anything that one wants to do for Afghanistan in the future also. Um, and the other thing, um, which is more internal, um, is that, uh, for example, in the uh, last 20 years of the US involvement, um, the US never understood that um, the, the concept of justice as it is in the Afghan tradition, Adalat, 
um, and uh, which is in modern terms rule of law, basically. Um, that is more important to um, the Afghans traditionally, historically, than having a full stomach. And because the US um, approach in Afghanistan was always from the beginning in 2001 until the end, um, stability first, uh, stability at the cost of justice, at the cost of rule of law. This um, allowed uh, the re-empowerment of warlords, of local um, strongmen, um, both in terms of economics, uh, you know, getting uh, lucrative contracts and getting richer and richer by the day, uh, and also uh, being above the law all the time. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, the, the, the lack of rule of law or um, the um, weakness of rule of law really played a big role in my estimation in uh, the rise of the Taliban uh, and uh, it, the, the weak state all through. Uh, so th these two issues need to be really addressed uh, for any reconceptualization of, of the Afghan state that anyone would want to do. Steve, did you want to comment on that? I was just thinking, I think she's absolutely right about the centrality of justice. Um, she knows better in the sense of the historical traditions, but in my experience of the war against the Taliban as a reporter, I often encountered a profound interest at the local level in which side was uh, delivering justice and which was not. Um, and I was just thinking about an experience I had visiting Kandahar in 2011 um, on my own uh, and just kind of falling in with uh, local folks who were working for the UN and for other international organizations and they had been subjected to Taliban uh, assassination notices. They'd been told that they were on the target and there was a lot of assassination going on in Kandahar at the time. And I met this one uh, fellow who had received uh, a death notice and he said, and now let me show you this. They also gave him, the Taliban had also given him uh, a kind of memo that said, um, if you have been targeted in error, if you believe you have been targeted in error, please call our ombudsman, 1-800-577, and they will sort it out. Like if we've got your name wrong or if so, and you know, the extent to which informal Taliban justice uh, delivered at mosques uh, on Fridays and you, know, you leave your contribution on the way out, it was very rough. Uh, the young, you know, uh, self-educated, um, religious authorities who decided whose fence was on whose land um, probably didn't have the training to make sound decisions, but the fact that they did so on the merits that both sides had a hearing was often cited to me as being in sharp contrast to the official courts of the Republic in Kandahar, which were basically a bidding uh, game where you, you had to buy your way uh, to an outcome. And the sense of contrast between kind of grassroots uh, justice. I don't want to romanticize the Taliban because they were brutal uh, and, and unjust in many ways, but, but that narrative that they were able to create and, and to, in, to some extent deliver on uh, at the local level was a powerful factor in, in the war, at least in my encounters with it from time to time. It's all about the narrative. Um, I, I want to bring it back to a question, and, and we're running out of time, um, but uh, one of uh, members of the audience wanted to know if you had any suggestions, either one of you, on how to put more pressure on the Biden administration for the U.S. to make the sort of investments honoring policies of the special immigrant visa applicants. This is somebody who has been trying very hard to get somebody out of uh, Afghanistan. Um, she's been lobbying political representatives. She's been working with Afghans in America. Um, one family, she says, has a special airport visa that was issued by the U.S. Embassy. Any, any suggestions you might have in terms of you know how how to move this, understanding is that uh, all of the SIV applicants are um, you know allowed to apply. It's just that the waiting period uh, is even longer now than than before because of the others who 
uh, have left Afghanistan who were not um, part of the SIV um, group or, you know, they, they were not uh, directly working for the U.S. military or, or U.S. embassy, but uh, their lives were endangered. Um, those are the other categories. So um, I don't think there is there is a problem in accepting um, the SIVs. It's just a matter of timing, which understandably uh, for those who have remained in Afghanistan, uh, you know, every day is, is risky for them. You know, um, sort of in closing, because we, we have just, just a few minutes left. Um, you both, all of us actually, are, are parents of kids at various ages. Um, what advice would you maybe give in terms of how you have a conversation about what's, what's, what's taken place in Afghanistan, what may be next? Um, Helena. What sorts of conversations do you have at, at, at your dinner table with, with your son? Um, our dinner conversations are very serious. Um, they have been for a long time since my son was much younger too. Um, you know, a, more, a lot about Afghanistan, what, how, what's happening there but also about uh, global issues, about current affairs in general, about uh, the state of the environment, about um, you know, um, uh, discrimination, racial discrimination, gender inequality, um, you know, various very, very serious topics. And uh, not only my son, but now that we are here in uh, Chestnut Hill, my nephew, Sam, uh, who is also uh, an SCH uh, student, he is also very much into these issues. And, and I'm glad that uh, both of our youngsters are genuinely interested in, in these important uh, issues. And we continue to, to discuss them every evening. Uh, and and I, I do hope that uh, all families do that because uh, protecting uh, the children from all the evils of the world uh, in today's, uh, you know, internet age is impossible anyway. Uh, so it's better to have constructive um, discussions with them to make them understand some of the issues, and um, and and make them aware of of uh, what's behind issues. Uh, so uh, I I do hope that uh, this evening we uh, we had some students from a CH. If not, I hope the parents would discuss um, at least Afghanistan uh, with them because, because as the title of this discussion suggests, um, Afghanistan does matter to uh, the Americans and to, to the future of this country because uh, it's, uh, you know, and now uh, there is a good chance that it, it would become uh, yet again um, the center of uh, various international terrorist groups um, threatening the world. Uh, it matters because um, America, you know, the, the most sophisticated uh, military in the world lost to a, a ragtag uh, group of, you know, extremist terrorists in Afghanistan. Um, things need to be explained to, to the kids why this happened and, and uh, what are the lessons to, to learn from, from the U.S. experience in Afghanistan. So, Elena, yeah, I do hope that uh, everyone else does what we do. Right. I, I know students are listening tonight and I understand that they're going to be discussing what, what they've heard here what they've heard here in this important discussion this evening. Steve, I, I know that your son is younger than Helena's. Um, what sort of conversations do you have? And, and what advice do you give? Because this clearly is, is, is your area of expertise. Well, our main conversation has been initiated by him towards his mother. When are you going to stop saving the people of Afghanistan and pay more attention to me? Um, <laughs> we've had to uh, work our way through and uh, one of the families that uh, Americans that she was collaborating with to get this evacuation work moving also had a seven-year-old and they reported that their seven-year-old said that he would make a $50 contribution uh, to their um, you know, fund if they would 
get off the phone every night at eight o'clock. <laughs> and, and, so, and then they, they accepted his contribution and then he asked for a refund because they didn't stop the war. So it's been, uh, we're, we're gonna broaden the conversation now. And I think the serious only thing, I agree everything with uh, that Helena said, I think was very powerful and eloquent. The only two things I would add is that the single most effective way to broaden your mind and deepen your understanding of any place, but especially a place like Afghanistan today is to, encounter its people. And uh, in Helena, you know, tonight we have an example of how, how powerful and enriching that is. But, you know, this community um, has, um, has a, um, a growing number of Afghans arriving into it. Um, you know, a friend of ours was helping the resettlement uh, around Philadelphia and said something like a thousand Afghans have passed through Philadelphia International Airport just in the last uh, weeks. And uh, what we've been talking about at home is not stopping our efforts to help people get out, but flights are now almost impossible. Um, and it's gonna be a slower grind uh, there, but as Helena referred to with, in the case of her husband, but uh, resettlement is also important. Uh, there's a lot of people arriving in our community uh, who need support, need help. You know, I, I always love the can Canadian policy of matching newcomers to single families and and having that experience become so intimate that way well um, we're not organized that way but but there's lots of us uh, lots of opportunity for us to to help and and to be enriched and to learn uh, by by doing so these are not folks um, you know as uh, you know who have who have served and and earned PhDs and and, and have the, the, the beautiful um, our, uh, way of describing uh, Afghanistan that Helena uh, possesses, but, um, but in their complexity, in their trauma, uh, in their circumstances, there's something for all of us uh, to, to learn and, and encounter and, and try to respond to. All right, I, I think that's a perfect note to end on, to turn back to Steve, but I just want to say thank you so much to Ambassador Elena Malikar and Dean Steve Call for, for having this really important, insightful conversation. So appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks. I want to thank you, uh, Ambassador, Dean, Renee, um, Steve. I, I, I couldn't feel more strongly around the words that you just shared. Um, get to know people from, from places different than where you grew up and you will learn that you have mo much more in common and breaking bread with people and talking to people you'll understand the, the human bonds that are global um, and i just I thank you for bringing your insights to our community tonight uh, i hope people I, I am sure everyone will think about this conversation tomorrow and after tomorrow and i know our students will benefit from it and i hope we as a community benefit from it Thank you both, Renee. Thank you for your amazing uh, skills that you always bring to us in your role. Um, again, take care, Helena. Take care, Steve. And thank you for being part of our community for sharing your wisdom tonight. Good night. Well, good evening, Bye, everyone. everyone. Take care.